And the loser's bracket continues in the Healing League, our Korean tournament, and we have another best of three. So now in the loser's bracket again, we're going through the first few matches, and we are in best of three territory with C8 now going up against Is This Ginny. And our first map is Braxis. So the Koreans also dropping Braxis into the map pool. And we have on the left side Muradin and Rexa. Rexa for the top lane, of course, with Tigers and Genji for damage. And we get Anduin once again as a support here. Could be the word. Or we could get finally some Light Bomb engage with Genji, which is hopefully what we're going to see here. A bit more of a tip to the hat to the Western meta. And the red team, and this is Ginny with Artanis. <laughs> Uther main tank and Artanis. Malfurion for the X. Extra heals, and then we get Junkrat, and we have Greymane. And Atan is no protector of Aya as the level 1 talent. Ah, uh, Trash Tannis already dropping the stacking quest. I hate that quest with the passion of a thousand burning suns. It's insane. I wish this was good. I really, really wish they would make it a little bit stronger. And he would get more of an oomph out of it, but then generally I just hope that at some point in the future when uh, some developer on the side of Blizzard gets a little bit drunk and does something that he shouldn't do, aka update Heroes of the Storm, we're gonna get a slight numbers patch so that Atanis gets just some general love and gets finally rid of the well-deserved name Trash Tanis. So, either way, at the top lane, obviously, we have him going up against Rexa, but here is also Genji, who has an easy time rotating between lanes on Braxis, and will, of course, then try to put some extra pressure onto the solo laner. Whoever loses this series is out of the tournament, so the winner still has a chance to make it slowly through the loser's bracket and enter the grand final. But for the loser, it is all over. And also, again, quick reminder in case that you're wondering, yes, we do not have a draft here, and the reason is fairly simple. This was obviously a tournament held in Korea, therefore totally different time zone, made it really difficult to catch all of the games live wasn't able to catch all of them as they were playing, playing it out. Usually what happened is that the organizers gave you the replays immediately afterwards and then I cast the games in the evenings only a few hours later. But of course draft information aren't really entered into replays which is why sometimes the draft was simply missing. So it's not an intentional choice or anything where it's like I hate drafts. It's just yeah, the name of the game. Blizzard, unfortunately, back when they started to uh, still put some attention to years of the storm, never really bothered entering draft information into replays. wasn't really part of the system that they had here. So Uther dying, and it seems like Junkrat is also getting the axe here. Actually taken down by Mandarin. So apparently Anduin manning up a little bit here. And the fight for the beacon is, of course, on. Game number one in the best of three. You want to put your foot down, you know. Lead with a little bit of a jab to set the tone here. And for Tigers, that means we now get uh, the bigger they are, they're gonna try and burn particularly Artanis down. I mean, the man can take a punch. You can always talk about him and uh, they'll say about him whatever you want, but he can definitely take a beating, which is usually all the rest of the role that he has, unless you have somebody that performs absolute god swaps. So far, we haven't seen any of them, but ooh, Murden. Also a bit in trouble there for just a second. Gets pulled out of the fight by Anduin and is still fine here. We still have not seen a level 4 talent yet for Junkrat. By the way, Reverberation as our level 4 choice for Muradin. So no healing static later on level 13. Is going instead very likely for Bronzebeard Rage of course. But yeah, with that, let's see what they can do at the top. Again, a bit of action against Satanus, but they're turning it quickly. And this time they're trying to go for Samira for Rexa. And that is a dead Rexa right there. Problem is that Atanis also falls. So it's a kill for a kill. But there's at least a few progress points for the blue team. And you know what? They're trying to get some more. They got Genji now at the top, and Maximus with his gray main is not really confident. So all of a sudden, both of them belong to the blue team, but not for long, since down at the bottom of the map after a kill on Tychus, we now have is this Ginny with some beacon control back in their hands. So still a fierce fight for the first objective for the first big Zerg wave couple of points to the name of the blue team and oh no gray main ah, our man in some trouble here and he goes down so they focus again on Atanas, but in comes Malfurion, the old geezer. Yep, and the boomer helps out with a heal or two and keeps Atanas in play, allows them to take out Genji. And we're still waiting for level 7. 
So, Artanis taking out the trash over here, getting rid of some Overwatch heroes, but then again, he himself also gets dropped, and that's him gone with Malfurion eating a ton of damage here too, dropping another root that didn't really hit anything, but Rexa can't really go that deep in the range. But the blue team is exactly where they want to be. They are leading in kills, they're leading in talents, they're getting another one here against Greymane, and of course they have control or had control for a long time over both beacons now, which means they're looking at 68% on the progress bar already. And no matter what happens here, that's a solid a solid Zerg wave. Oh, and that's just sneaky. Just as he thought he was safe, Genji, that old kill stealer, comes in from the top and takes down Junkrat. Another kill for the blue team. C8. I personally had them pecked them, uh, pack them as one of the favorites in this tournament, and they certainly delivered in a lot of their games, but then in the winner bracket, they were eventually taken out. We have some really strong teams here, honestly. So C8 finds themselves in the loser's bracket and is now just trying to make their way back to the grand final. Level 7 talents on both sides by now, finally, but there is still that lead and experience for C8 and they're getting, of course, more value. It's a full Zerg wave for them now at the bottom of the map, but the full 100% right there. And they need Junkrat, they need Greyman there quickly. And in an ideal world, they already had access to Junkrat's ult so that they have more wave there that they can use. But they are definitely going to get a bit of a beating. And oh, that's particularly true for Uther. And he's down already. Grenade to the face. Uther plays. Playing as a uh, cosplaying as Bruno Mars over here and catches the grenade easily. The double support really doesn't work out for Is This Genie. They were trying to go for that Uther main tank and then having Malfurion as a backup, so a lot of, a lot of heals, huge amount of sustain, but it's not really working out. But they're getting some kills in finally, so a fourth one now being dropped as Artanis is proving to be useful and drops. Murden. The problem is that level 10 is so close that yeah, they don't want to overstay in that fight either. So the battle is still raging on and this is actually a 5 versus 4 now. So the blue team has to be a bit careful, but they're trying to turn this now. Has another good route on the ground yeah, against Tychus and he's immediately in trouble and is getting executed here. So job well done by the red team. They lose their fort, so that's definitely bad news, but at least they're able to get some value out of all of this. Nice swap! <laughs> value Tanners right there. Gets the swap and they get the kill. Six kills to eight, but now we got level 10 on the board. And that of course changes things a little bit. So now they have a lead for half a level. With Genji still down, it's unlikely that they can do anything. And thank God, we don't have the bubble. We get the light bomb engage with Genji. So many tournaments that we already had, or so many games in this tournament, where the Koreans just said, you know what? This thing that the Europeans do, the thing that we are seeing on North America all the time, light bomb Genji, nah, we don't need that. Got no use for it. Bubble, way better. Did you see that thing? big shiny dome yeah that's what we're gonna go for so this time we get the combo we get exactly what we're used to from the western scene which i can definitely appreciate but yes obviously very different priorities here in the korean and the asian meta when we're talking about anduin so we're seeing a lot more of the holy word salvation than we ever would on the european or north american server but with that, we also have on the red team side, a Reptire, that's the next one in. We get the Suppression Pulse, and we get the Divine Shield for Uther with even more sustain, thanks to Malfurion in his level 10, going here for Serenity. Yeah, and with that, we're set up for the next big battle, particularly once that those beacons are activating again, and uh, then we're also having still a boss on the map that could potentially be claimed, but for in order for that to happen, you first and foremost need to actually, yeah, take a few heroes down. It would, by the way, be amazing if you could swap that. <laughs> if you could swap the boss. <laughs> that would be kind of funny. Can you imagine if you could just, like, gorge the boss and just uh, get him through a portal with Medivh and could just place him right next to the opponent's fort and then he attacks the fort or something? It would be kind of funny if you could just turn some of these uh, triggers uh, off and on in the game and uh, <laughs> enter some very interesting mechanics that could be exploited by teams in maybe more of a fun mode of the game. 
but uh, that would be kind of funny. Don't take mercenary camps down, just like go for hungry, hungry stitches, capture them and <laughs> release them somewhere. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of dumb ideas that we could definitely come up with in order to make things a bit more interesting and uh, get a funny mode into the game, but yeah. Beacon's up again, so now we're gonna look at the next objective. The route was already on its way as Muradin was jumping out, so good for him. 160 stacks for our boy Artanis. 15,000 damage, nothing to write home about on his end, but again, you compare that over to Muradin, and he's a little bit ahead of that. Has already died twice, on the other hand. Anduin on the blue team, the only one that hasn't died. Yeah, figures, I mean, again, he is usually employing the French defense when uh, we're talking about his positioning in team fights and he's running away as fast as he can. And he's really fast. I mean, that boy has some practice. He's been doing his intervals, he's doing his sprints and everything. So if you're talking about running away, I mean, Anduin, he's your man. He can really teach you a lesson or two there. Either way, now that we're looking at level 13 advantage for CA, they all of a sudden saying, you know what, boys? Let's go enforce that fight, let's go that top lane and try and take on that beacon. And once again, they're able to pull it off and has nobody close to the bottom beacon. So the red team really has to fight now for the top lane. And that's what they're trying to do. Here come the boars getting unleashed, light bomb and the kill. The Malfurion is dead. The Boomer says goodbye as he's getting dropped in the back line. The Divine Shield is at least saving Junker to fight another day. But guess what? Over here, it is once again Artanis that gets murdered. Artanis gone, so is Malfurion. And another 100% Zerg wave for C8. They win the entire thing. Only the minimum amount for is this Ginny. They get their... 18% there, so they get the bare minimum, a couple of Zerglings and an Ultralist, this is all that we had in the shop for them today. And the boss, of course, taken out to by C8. They're really going for a big setup here with a one-two punch top lane. That's going to be a huge push. And, well, Riptire might be able to take some of these waves out. But this is going to take down the fort and probably a lot more than that, particularly with the boss now moving in. Granted, we're only 11 minutes into the game, but this could be devastating, especially if they're able to get a kill too. And they're going, they're going immediately for Greymane. The Riptire, by the way, only used against heroes here, which normally is great, but that also means that they're lacking a little bit of wave clear to take down these waves down. And with Greymane gone, that's an added layer that they really don't need right now. That makes things so much more difficult. Now Junkrat is taken down. Yes, Tranquility is out, but just look how quickly Anduin was saving the day for the Dwarf as Muradin was pulled out, and boy, oh boy, is that a slaughter now. 15 to 13 on the levels, we got 12 kills to 6, and here they come, going for Koa, going for the lead in game number 1, C8. Definitely not kidding around here. They're taking no prisoners in this one. They're really trying to get that quick victory on the first map. And it doesn't look like anybody is going to be able to stop them here. Already at 50%. Boss still up. And that is the lead for C8 in this best of three series against Is This Ginny in the loser's bracket of our Korean tournament. GG. Well played. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, C8 with the lead. This time we have them on all drag pass with Muradin and Hogger, Tychus and Tracer. So we're gonna get some Chinese Tracer plays here with Brightwing as the main healer. This has, by the way, not changed. Reset, first of all, it's weird to see him on the healer position. That is still doesn't change for me. It's not something that I'm really all that used to, but he loves Brightwing. The guy just plays Brightwing whenever he has an opportunity to do so. So that's what we have right now. Over on the right side in the meantime, we got Isis Ginny with the man himself playing Leoric. We got Maximus on Johanna. And for the damage, we get Urel and Junkrat. A Rega making a rare appearance here. Now, this is probably one of the things that surprises me 
a lot when I'm looking at the meta changes, the meta differences between the European and North American side and what we're seeing in uh, the Eastern uh, games, that Rhaegar is another one of these heroes that is not played a lot. Now don't get me wrong, it's not like Rhaegar is getting played every single game on the Western side either, but you see him a lot more, particularly on maps where you want to make use of that Lightning Shield too. Infernal Shrines could be a map for that. When we're talking about Garden of Terror, this is something that oftentimes happens. But it doesn't really happen a whole lot in this context. So that's fairly interesting too. We talked about a lot of the differences between what they are prioritizing and what they don't. Tyke is being insanely high. Vala practically banned every game. And some of the, uh, yeah, the other priority picks that exist on that side. But now that we're on Alderac Pass, of course, the goal for the red team is to bring this back, right? They need to win two in a row. If they lose here on Alderac, then they are out of the tournament. C8, they were able to finish Braxis in roughly 13 minutes, so they're going to be interested to now coming in and try to take this one out as well. Can they pull it off? That's the question. Camps, of course, taken by both teams. And we'll see a little bit how they are playing around the prisoner camp once that it gets announced as well, once that we have the objective on the map. Because there's, of course, a couple of dynamics here too, where on the western side you see most of the teams focus on the, or the oh, sorry, on the prisoner camp roughly between level 7 and level 10. It doesn't happen earlier than that, but maybe here they have a slightly different approach to it. Mirrodin, seems like KCB, really fancies that playstyle, is always in the thick of things with him. And then uh, uh, gets some good usage out of the trade. Ah, oh, and stumbles that minion straight to the face. Bad minion. <laughs> Alright, so level 4 talents kicking in for both. The typical build that we're seeing on the Eastern players for Leo, Consume Vitality, New Ghastly Reach. I haven't seen a single Leo player that picked anything else in this entire tournament. It seems like this is just the go-to build for the Korean players, Europeans, North Americans. Oftentimes you will get Osun's Renewal and of course on level 4 pretty much every single talent gets taken there as well. Tracer on level 4 with the Pulse Generator after the traditional parting gift on level 1. Currently dealing with Leoric up at the top lane. Magic Spit for Brightwing. And yeah, Leo has to deal with this, but of course there's a lot more wave clear that he brings to the table compared to what Tracer with her little water pistols there can pull off. But, well, still a bit of extra damage being done down here at the bottom of the map now with the grenades that we're getting from Tychus has gone into Master Assassin. Again, only for the passive. You sometimes see a Tychus player complete that quest too, but it is rare. You take it for the increased attack speed. That translates over into Odin, of course, as well. I mean, I really hope that he picks Odin. We, uh, I believe, had one drill game already. <laughs> and it was kind of wild. <laughs> Not a talent that I'm used to see. I really still hope that this was a misclick. And that it wasn't intentional. But yeah, drill was wild. But they're going for the camp a bit early, even before level 7. So it seems like it's going to be a battle of whichever team gets to level 7. That can fight this one out. So is this Ginny being aggressive here? They get a couple of seconds out of this. So a nice little play made by them. Might be able to build on it and get that first objective. And lock it in. Murden with a jump going straight in. And they take Jojo down. Joanna eliminated. First blood in the game. 4C8. The dirty trickster for Junkrat. I always want to call the talent the Dirty Trixler. <laughs> kind of fits as well. And we get the Seed Charge for Jojo down at the bottom of the map now. Stormbolt connects and oh no! Oh, it's Brightwing coming in. There was just no way for Sylvanas to escape. The timing on the stun was just too good. She was trying to jump on her wave of course, but couldn't really make it work. And then she was completely lost and all alone against three and got taken out. So there's a huge opportunity for CA to get the first objective. Get that cavalry into the game and they're gonna pull this one off. 
So yeah, they're taking Rhaegar down. That's three kills to zero. They're ahead by half a level. And now they got the objective too. Leo won't survive either. Another kill for C8. And they are looking great in this series. I mean, I'm telling you, these guys, they want to go to the grand final. They weren't happy when they got dropped down into the loser's bracket. So now they're doing their best to correct that mistake and make it as quickly as possible to the next round of the tournament and just stay in here. With level 10 only half a level away, there's a very good chance that C8 is going to get lots and lots of value out of the first objective. Even though the first wave of cavalry is normally not all that strong. We're only 5 minutes into the game, so it's not like these guys are super, super powerful. In the middle, you can already tell the first one has been taken apart. Up at the top, they're still trying to take this out too. And Tracer is helping out as well. I guess at the bottom of the map is where we can uh, probably expect the most damage. But now that the half of the red team is moving in, I uh, believe that's not going to happen here either. But they got level 10 now. So they got level 10. Insta attack up at the top. So they're trying to see if maybe they can drop at least Tychus. Uh, sorry, not Tychus. At least Leo here. And yes, they can. Leo turning into Leoki. Activating his trait. And now they're just attempting to maybe even take that fort out. If anything, I'm surprised that Tychus didn't pop Odin, because one thing that we've seen a lot in this tournament now is that the first team to 10, particularly with Tychus, they usually drop Odin immediately, trying to push with the initial Odin, one of the structures down, take a wall apart. This time they waited a bit longer and have not activated any big uh, ults yet. And we get the rocket ride again! Nice! I like Rocket Ride. I can't really help myself. I'm not saying it's a better talent, but it's definitely funny. It's a real fun one. I talked previously about how it was played in uh, the North American meta for a while. Because back then, what players would essentially do is use it against uh, Deathwing. So that's something that happened. Deathwing can't really escape Rocket Ride. So it was a very interesting counter when Deathwing was played a lot more often. Obviously limited your options in other areas, but still. Now we have six kills to zero, and we get the rocket ride, and let's see how much damage he can do with that, and who they're gonna target here, if they're gonna drop that on Tigers a bit. Next prisoner camp is coming up soon, and of course they're still pushing, particularly down at the bottom of the map, we're getting Junkrat now, with a lot of value, and since Murden is now also arriving, it means that they had some hopes of taking Junkrat out and go for the fort. And they got it low. They got it really low. Yeah, Hogger with a Horder pulled, jumping out here, using his ult to escape as they saw the flank coming in. I find this side lane tracer fairly amusing, by the way. <laughs> this, is, this is still funny to me. So tracer the, the entire time here with a pew pew pew, sitting on that side lane. 41,000 siege damage for her, but still a respectable 20k on hero damage. So it's not too bad. The camps are still diligently taken. By is this Ginny all about that mid lane pressure that they're looking for. But we have the talent advantage again for C8. So now they are at level 13 and we get untouchable. Oh yeah, can't touch this baby. So, Tracer dropping the MC Hammer over here. And in addition to that, we get the Neo Steel coding. They should be able to take this one out fairly easily. I don't think that the minions are gonna get it, but one more grenade is all that's needed here and they can say goodbye to that fort. So that's gonna be the first one that gets destroyed. Still going for the chase against our man Muradin. KCP makes it out, okay. <laughs> uh, I love the sound pack of, of Junkrat. <laughs> Sounds like a gremlin at times. But yeah. Red team is trying to fight. Duh. They gotta do something here, right? So they gotta ha somehow try and turn this. And first of all, they gotta try and get uh, their first kill. Team fights haven't really gone their way yet. And now that the first fort is lost, that also marks a bit of a sore spot. Sylvanas has started to push out the lanes a bit, particularly down at the bottom of the map. But here in the middle, they also have to be careful. Leo going for the Omnus Wraith. And Rega with the tidal waves now. But Junkrat is really making it difficult for them. He already pushed out the bot lane and helped them to destroy the fort there. Now he's continuing his good work up at the top. 
Of course, at the same time, with the camps up again, you want to rescue some prisoners, and the blue team is already pushing their way in in an attempt to get access to this one as well. Brightwing controlling the bot lane a bit. Hogger ah, spins out, doesn't even have to use the Horda pulled in order to escape from this situation. But Brightwing is getting some extra XP for them, and that means one and a half level lead nearly for C8. Now, Brightwing is probably going to be forced back pretty soon because the red team is now trying to go for the objective as well. They're essentially just trying to force a fight here and force something before level 16. And it works for them. And now it's a 5 versus 5. They're already retreating a bit here. Muradin is trying to flank in. Yeah, full vision on the other hand. Went straight through the grunt, so they know definitely where he is. Gets the stumble connected anyways, and that is an Ancestral on Leoric. That keeps the skeleton in play. But they gotta do more than that. They need to get a kill at some point. Another Stormbolt, and Sylvanas is gone. Sylvanas is dead. Now they try for Rega. He's already on the run. Brightwing with some additional heals. But it's a 5 versus 4. And the experience gap is widening as C8 is looking to grab level 16 talents. That will definitely give them the upper hand in this fight over the prisoner camp. The bullet spray. Tracer with one stack on the untouchable now. And there is the full grenade build for Tychus. We haven't seen it all that much, honestly. They oftentimes went into spray and pray and just overkill. But no, in this case, we have a full grenade build. Jojo has already fallen. There comes the rocket right. And it hits nothing, really. Not a big impact. I thought he would go for Bright, but he had tried to get the kill. But nope, rocket right with very limited effect. Eight kills to zero. They're going for the perfect game. C8 is really making a statement here. I told you earlier, they are not happy that they find themselves in the loser's bracket. Not by a little bit. So now, with a two-level advantage, they go for the objective. 41,000 damage for Tychus. 31,000 for Tracer. 27,000 for Hogger. And they're looking good. They're looking really good here. It's a five-man on the map now for is this Ginny for the red team. But they're not even trying to go for the camp. Maybe now on the back end of that objective, but of course the big problem is still that level gap and that talent advantage. And Junkrat gets killed. Don't even have a chance to do anything about that at the objective. Junkrat goes down, killed by Tracer here in the middle, two level lead. And it is still Murden that is trying to get the next set of Raiders for his team. They are finally putting some resistance in here, but it is, in my opinion, too little too late. They're really trying, but here comes the rest of the blue team, and that is going to put a stop to it. The next set of the cavalry is there. They're trying to get a kill. It's a 4 versus 5, though, with the talent advantage, which is bad news. They might kill Murden, indeed they do, but I think they're going to pay for that. Sylvanas is dead, and the grenade hits Jojo hard, so they are again trading badly. Two kills for one, and losing the objective. And while all of this happens and Leoric dies too, Tracer is in the middle with a camp and is now going to eliminate the final fort of Is This Ginny. Boy, this one hurts. Yeah, this one hurts a lot. 12 kills to 1. At least they got a kill. I mean, at least they finally got a kill. Might sound a little bit silly, but they were able to pull something off here. So now the only question is how many of these keeps can they take down? Now it's about the removal of armor shields on the core. Currently still sitting at three. If you can remove two, you can make a play for core. Would not recommend usually to try and do that when you only have one armor shield removed. Normally that doesn't really go your way. Or at least it is a big risk to take. But here, the attack is still coming. They're getting good damage in at that keep. And at the top lane, there will be some damage as well, even though I doubt that they can take it out. Even the one in the middle is being saved. So yes, some damage done at the top too. And they've now transitioned down to the bottom of the map, hoping to at least obliterate the wall here. Look at the gap in experience. They are two and a half levels ahead now. Oh! And if anything, then I'm surprised that they're not sieging up at the mid lane a little bit more. And well, I guess they're doing now. Yep, there it is. Odin gets popped. Talking about sieging up. So now they're trying to take that keep down for good. There's no level 20 advantage yet, but they have the upper hand. The stats advantage alone is heavily in their favor. But yeah, if they really want to take that keep down, they got to focus a little bit uh, more heavily there. 
Get more pressure at the bottom of the map too. Keep is gone. First armor shield removed. That leaves the core only with two. And of course now they're hoping for level 20. Is he gonna try and drop it in two? Nah, not yet. Tracer is getting chased as well. She's basically done with her quest. Hasn't really died here yet, so Untouchable is definitely going to boost her damage output a bit more. Nice timing on the Ancestral. That helped them to keep Sylvanas in the game. But now we have level 20 talents, and of course C8 in a really nice spot with Storm talents over the opponent's team. Another hit against Jojo. She's gone, and that opens the bot lane up wide. Oh, yes. Red team is in trouble. They are so close getting eliminated from this tournament now. And it is a desperate struggle to try and turn the game around. But can they make that happen? That's the big question now. At this point, it doesn't really look like it. Another Storm Bolt. Hold up, hold. They go for Sylvanas. And she gets out. So does Junkrat. He barely escapes. And again, the rocket right with no real value. Keep at the top lane, keep at the bot lane. They've all taken damage. But now, of course, they are going to put the finishing touches to the bot lane structure. And this is really the moment when you can start going for core. Either you are going for the top lane and take that keep out, or you're just saying, you know what, guys, at this point, we can just make the play. Particularly since they already have uh, Odin back, big red button is available. But it seems that they're not even going for it. Now, they could go for a boss, of course. That's another play that they could easily make, but instead what we're seeing is them going for the next objective. Yeah, and is this Ginny? What are they doing? They gotta contest this. Now you can always say like, well, they don't have level 20 talents, what are they, they supposed to do? And I'm, I'm telling you what they're supposed to do. Fight. It's a shitty fight. I totally agree. Sylvana's now dying at the bottom of the map. But you gotta do something. Once that the extra set of cavalry comes in, that game is over. So you have to take the bad battle. It's horrible. You don't want to go up against level 20 talents if you can avoid it. The problem is in this situation, you just simply cannot avoid it. You're already facing against an opponent's way stronger than you. Uh, than you. You're literally backed into a corner of figuratively. So they got it somehow make this work and they just don't they lost sylvanas is a four versus five talent down objective is claimed and that should be it i mean now you can already see how pinned down in their base they are on those lanes every single lane is heavily pushed against them there's no chance for the red team to grab level 20 in time so this is gonna be very disastrous right now 14 kills to 1. I just don't see it. Unless the 8 really throws the game hard now. This should be a glorious victory for us, this Ginny. And who, by the way, was a feeder? Murden feeding hard. Insta report right there. Five reports for sure. Should report himself. Only one to die here. And denying the perfect game to his team. But yep, there it is. Core gets attacked. That bottom keep, of course, is not going to make it either, considering that it's now attacked. Oh, that on the other hand is going to hit hard. Yeah! And two with Rocket Ride. Finally a bit of damage, but still no kill. They might get Tychus, but first it is Sylvanas that falls. So does Rega and Leoric, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be it. Jojo is gone. That leaves Junkrat nearly a five-man wipe as C8 takes a series with a 2-0 and moves on to the next round of the loser's bracket. GG. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.